Thank you. Um, really looking forward to having this opportunity. This is my first time at JupyterCon. Didn't make it last year due to a competing event, uh, but been to PyCon and SciPy over the years. Um, but very excited about how this community is uh, bringing together both uh, the open source, open development world, and uh, businesses as well. Uh, I'm going to talk today about some use of Jupyter Lab and Jupyter widgets in particular that we've been using to explore some of the massive data sets that we have available at Google on the Earth Engine project. Uh, but a lot of what I'll be talking about is not really applicable just to uh, Earth Engine, our back end. There's a, it's applicable, I think, to a lot of other geospatial data sets that are out there in um, geospatial APIs that are being stood up by different organizations around the world. Uh, so to lay out a little bit of what I'm going to be going over to, the general problem is that the Earth is big, it's massive, it's messy, it's changing. And we have a lot of data on what is going on in the Earth from observations, uh, particularly from aerial satellite uh, uh, platforms. Uh, we also have a lot of weather and uh, climate simulation models that are giving us forecasts and projections of what might happen in the future under different conditions. Uh, so we can generate a lot of data about the Earth, but it's a, it's a very large and intractable amount of data for, for many people. And so I, I want to explore the ways that I can see that Jupiter can be very useful for exploring these really massive data sets in the different locations that they're at. And I think a key part of this is the Jupyter widgets uh, functionality within uh, Jupyter that is really, uh, in my mind, quite uh, necessary for doing this type of work. Uh, Google is a very uh, happy, I guess, with Jupyter and a strong supporter of it. We use it for a lot of our public-facing uh, applications, collaboratory, uh, is free online hosted notebooks uh, that integrate with like Google Drive that you can save kind of the idea of a notebook in a, in a drive setting. Uh, Cloud Data Lab is running uh, Docker containers that are customized with a customized version of uh, Jupyter. Uh, and then also Kaggle uses it for both its competitions and also using use it for uh, teaching about uh, data science uh, with the notebook environment. Uh, Google's also been a, a pretty strong sponsor of just this open development, open science uh, movement. We do a lot of work uh, sponsoring folks for the, in various open source projects through the Summer of Code, working with NumFocus on this. And just this year, we became a corporate sponsor of NumFocus, so that's one way that we can actually support and maintain the, the community and all the great open source projects that are going on. Uh, but I don't work on any of those particularly. I'm very appreciative to, of those. But I work on a small part of Google that is within GEO, and we work on empowering uh, groups, organizations around the world that have some mission that's around environmental or social uh, issues. So they, these tend to be international NGOs. They might be UN organizations. There are a lot of philanthropies. They have really good ideas of what needs to change, and they've studied that, and they have the flexibility to make that possible if they're given the right tools. Uh, so Google Earth Outreach is a team within Google that specializes on that, trying to match up technology with all of these global issues. Uh, and then we also develop our own technology, and there's a platform at Google called Earth Engine, and that came out of Earth Outreach about nine years ago. This is the whole reason I came to Google is to work on this, this platform, and it is basically m making it possible to do this really large geospatial data science on the, on the order of terabytes uh, of data to petabytes at a time. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this later in the talk, but a lot of the stuff I will be talking about is just more general about how do you uh, use widgets to access data sets like something that are similar to what Earth Engine provides. Uh, I should point out that I am not a computer scientist by training. I'm one of the few snow hydrologists that work at Google. Actually, I haven't met any of them. But this is kind of my background. It's like I grew up, uh, or at least through my uh, educational journey, was, was skiing around in the back country, digging snow pits, taking measurements with frozen fingers, and dealing with frozen machinery. Uh, uh, sampling equipment out in the field. And it gives you a good appreciation of how messy environmental data is in reality. And satellites just kind of scale that messiness up. So the, all the issues that you have in the field, they're the same ones when you start working with satellite data as well. Uh, this glamour shot, I'm not exactly sure who that is in the pit, but this is typical of what a day was out. You go out and you dig about two or three of these pits, and that's a day for you. You know, you pick, collect a few data points. Um, but going back to more of what Earth Outreach focuses on in these global issues, 
uh, it's always, we hear a lot about these global issues, but they're hard to wrap your head around and they're ha even harder for the general public to wrap their head around. So who kind of knows that there is deforestation going on in the Brazilian Amazon? Do you have an idea of how bad it is? And could you say whether 1% has been cut down, 2%, 5%, 10%? It's kind of vague, you know, you have this idea and it makes the news cycle, but it's really hard to like grasp, you know, the, what is actually going on. You get a picture of like an individual site, you get some metrics on like how many acres are cut down each year, but it's really hard to grasp. Uh, in contrast, if you're able to take satellite data and look at it over time, you can get a real picture of like what is happening and how the development is happening and how we might get an idea of stopping it over time. This is from in the Brazilian Amazon in a place called Rodonia. Um, this is sort of the impetus of why Earth Engine happened in the first place, is that people could see this type of satellite data on Google Earth, which is the consumer visualization product, and they said, give us access to this raw information so we can do like scientific discovery on that. Um, so that's kind of a lot of our background is like making data more accessible. Uh, we do that both in terms of visualizations, like that last video, which is called Google Time Lapse, and it's actually a video of the entire world at that scale, so you can look around and see what happened over the last like 32 years. We also help uh, academics and other algorithm developers scale up their, their science that they are doing and try to do things at a global scale. Here's an uh, example of work that we did with Matt Hansen of the University of Maryland. And he, his specialty is in working in kind of large scale deforestation. And so he built this data set of global forest change, which is at a 30 meter pixel resolution for the entire world through the Landsat record. Um, at least the recent Landsat record when we've had a lot enough of the satellite imagery over there. But it gives you a really great view of like what specifically happened and when did it happen. In this case, it's showing you the year of deforestation in that same part of Brazil. Uh, but you can basically scale or zoom out a little bit and see the patterns and like when they occurred and in what shape they were doing. And they're starting to use this even now for predicting what it, when it's going to happen in the near future. So you can send out law enforcement uh, to try to prevent this type of activity. So now we're looking at now more of like the pattern over South America. And this is more of an answer of like how bad has it been over the last, uh, in this case it's only about 12 years that we're showing here. But it's impacting a huge amount of the, the Amazon and other places around the world as well. Uh, so that's just an example of some of the things that you can get out of satellite data. I realize that people here coming to JupyterCon might not always realize what's involved with geospatial data, so I want to talk a little bit about that. I realize that I think geospatial is special, and maybe some of you share my own view, but I, I know that every scientific domain that's probably coming and using Jupyter has their own little data quirks or something that's important. So I'm going to give a quick overview of some of the geospatial data quirks that uh, we need to deal with. Uh, first is that there is a high dimensionality of the data. Uh, Ryan Abernathy talked yesterday about Pangeo and he did a really good overview of kind of the general problem of trying to get access uh, to some of these large structured data sets. Uh, but it's not just points, lines, and polygons that you typically see with the, like a, a geolocation app on a phone or something like that. It can be these continuous coverages of like the entire Earth might be your data set. And it, it's broken up in time. It might be pressure elevations uh, if you're looking at atmosphere or oceans. Um, occasionally, you have these projections of the future. So you have a creation time of running the simulation and a projection time of when you're trying to predict. There's all kinds of different dimensions. When you move into satellite data, in addition, you have this idea of like spectral bands and channels because satellites can see a lot more than like our native eye can see. They're looking in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Here's just a little bit of an overview of what a few of the satellites see in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is along the x-axis. Um, it, it highlights not just that there's a complexity of seeing through the atmosphere, which is that gray uh, area in the background. It's showing like how much, what is the transmission that these, the spectrum can go through the atmosphere and you have a chance of looking at but also the variety of different sensors. They sample different parts of the spectrum. They have different spatial characteristics. They have different uh, temporal characteristics. They're all looking at the Earth, but they're looking at the Earth in different ways, and it's really hard to combine that all together into actually estimating properties on the Earth. Uh, one advantage that we do have in geospatial engineering, I said advantage, I guess should should say advantage and disadvantage, is that uh, 
geospatial has this idea of that there is things that are near each other are correlated with other things that are near each other. It's cor you know, spatial correlation and temporal correlation. And so if you can't see something, you might be able to look around it in space or around it in time and still have a, a good way to infer what happened in a place that you couldn't see. It's also very important when you're trying to merge different resolution sensor data sets together, this idea of spatial correlation. If you're a statistician, though, it freaks you out because, you know, you come, usually in statistics, your assumption is that you have identically um, independently distributed normal <laughs> errors or something like that. That is not the case in geospatial data at all, and you have to take that into account while doing modeling. Um, just to harp a little bit more on the time aspects, I wanted to show a few more of these videos. This is where we're at right now in New York City over the last like 30 years. You can see the changes that are going on here. Um, we do a lot of sort of like terraforming around the earth, not just building cities, but doing these big open pit mines uh, in different areas. Uh, this is uh, going on in Germany, one of the mining activities. You can also see the, the big rotation of agricultural fields in the background. And some of it, we're not doing it, but the earth itself is changing all the time too. Here is a river over the course of 30 years in Brazil, and you can watch it move away, away from the city. And this, all of this you can see like in the Landsat archive, which goes back about 45 years at this point. Um, one last one here, I, I love this one because it's right, if you look closely, you can see when the hurricane came through. I forgot the name of the exact hurricane, but it just basically breaks out the seashore there. Um, so I just wanted to give you an appreciation that this spatial data is not static at all. A lot of the processes that we're interested in, if you're trying to catch deforestation or illegal fishing or something like that, they're happening at a rapid rate. And so you need to be able to incorporate large uh, inputs of data if you're trying to catch things in near real time. All right. Um, the, the, as I said, the Landsat program has been going on for about 45 years now. Uh, it's been a series of satellites. And for a long time, there was no digital distribution. They would actually just drop it on tape. These tapes, for in some cases, stayed at their ground receiving stations around the world for decades before they finally made it back to the United States, where they are now stored in the middle of a cornfield in South Dakota at the Eros Data Center. It's this interesting federal facility out in the middle of a cornfield. Um, but <laughs> made sense at the time, I think, when they built it there. Uh, but they have uh, this huge record of the Earth uh, on tape, and they've been doing a lot of work of extracting it uh, and getting it onto a digital format, and that's gone on uh, over the last uh, decade, this, this effort to digitize it. Uh, but a little bit more about the, the Landsat program. These, these satellites, there's been a series of seven of them. Occasionally we have two flying at the same time. They take about a 500 meg per scene, and that's when you're going over land, and that happens about every 45 seconds you're generating that data. And you think back that this has been happening for 40 years. So it gives you a scale of, of the amount of data uh, that is being generated. Uh, and the costs are a little bit, let me go through those individually here. Uh, it started off that it was, you could get a hard copy for like 15 bucks. And then it moved to, they had this idea of selling it commercially, so it partnered with some commercial entities, so it went up to $4,000 per scene. I don't know what the digital medium was at the time, but you didn't get a lot of use out of it because it's very expensive to use the data. Uh, at 1999, it dropped down to $600 a scene. This is about when I started with my remote sensing journey. And a lot of my work early on was actually whenever somebody in research bought one of these, we would give a way to share it with others because this was a distribution cost, not actually a licensing cost. So we, we had a lot of like, save this data because so nobody has to order the $600 scene from the government again. Uh, and then 2008, they made it free. As a result, this is the use of Landsat data. It, I didn't go back into the 70s and 80s because it is that extension of zero. And then as soon as they made it free and open and had a distribution policy, it took off. And this, I would say, in a large part, is why we started Earth Engine. We started it the year after this happened because there was all of a sudden this huge influx of data that people wanted to be able to analyze. But it's messy. This is what uh, Landsat looks like for that same place in Redonia when you're looking over the course of like a year. 2016 on the left, we got 15 images in the archive. In 2016, there were 16 images in the archive. Even the ones that look sort of clear, they're impacted by aerosols and other things that are going on. It's, really, it's a really indirect measurement is what I want to hammer home. And it's not just clouds, it's other things like the sensor degrades over time. You have flights that are not quite consistent. You know, the satellites move around. 
um, there's all kinds of different things that are, are, have to be taken into effect. The, where the light is coming from, the illumination, and where the sensor is pointing from as well. It's hard to work with. Um, so NASA does some pre-processing of this data to make it more easy to work with. Uh, starts off with level zero, it's what comes straight off the sensor. Pretty much nobody wants to work with that except the people that are doing the really low level sensitive work. Um, but most people, as it goes up the processing level, you know, they want it to be time re reference, they want it to be geometrically, radiometrically calibrated, and, it, and they do also want geophysical uh, variables out of it. So you want something like what is the amount of biomass rather than what is the red spectra at that point. Um, and then people also want it to be on a uniform space-time grid scale to make it easy to work with. That's not what satellites fly in. Um, and, and then eventually that you want to integrate uh, data from multiple models. So there's all kinds of these processing levels. And there's a really vigorous discussion in the remote sensing community now. It's like, what is analysis-ready data? Because in a sense, they've been doing this already, but everybody's analysis is a little bit different. And a lot of these steps in remote sensing analysis are still kind of researchy. And so there's no like general agreement on the best way to do it, but everybody uh, agrees that it's really a pain to do most of these steps. So it's a, it's a real tough uh, effort of trying to standardize these type of workflows. You start off with a level of processing that makes a bunch of happy users and then you go up and you make a few people happy with additional processing and then you make a lot of people sad the more processing you do. And it's really hard to find the right path of what type of processing you do. Uh, this is starting to become a lot more important because of the, there are groups that are setting up the ability to do analysis on the fly. So they could do this processing on the fly. So I want to go over a little bit of like how people get geospatial data. The first one is that there's these large repositories of, of data that you can get from USGS or the Copernicus program in, in the Europeans or JAXA in Japan. They allow file access, you can download it, so that's the top red one, and then you do all the analysis locally. So you're gonna have to cut up your area of interest, transform it into whatever you want, and then eventually do the visualization on your end. Uh, there are some groups, especially in the climate uh, arena, that are doing subsetting services. So you can order a subset of a file, which at least uh, limits the amount of stuff that you are downloading locally, but you're still downloading a file, transforming it and visualizing it locally. And then there's finally, there's the moving the analysis over to the data is this idea of an analysis service that you put everything on the server side that you can and try to just send instructions to the server on how to process it. Uh, Ryan Abernathy uh, in the keynote today talked about the dark repositories. I think these arrows up here are the representation of what is a generation of a dark repository. There are so many people that are downloading copies of data to work with it. Uh, but where do widgets come in? Well, first, I'm not going to spend too much time on the widgets tutorial. I'll assume there's some um, interest of those uh, because if you didn't know about widgets, I think you would have probably gone to the widget session that was at the same time. But widgets themselves are a way to uh, link up your, your Python kernel or other kernel that you're using in Jupyter with uh, something that you can see in the web page. And this allows you to have things like, uh, simple cases, a slider. You can declare one and you get a JavaScript slider to select a number in this case. Uh, and it can inform, you know, on the back end and your code can actually make use of that number, which is very useful. There's some higher order widgets. This one's called IPy leaflet, which is a way to wrap like a, a leaflet mapping JavaScript library that allows you to get a background reference for geospatial data. So that one is uh, very uh, useful. Make a use of that a lot. I think the nice thing about it is they have this, I, this uh, concept of a tile layer that can be overlaid on it. So if you are a geospatial data provider, as long as you know how to make tiles, you can uh, overlay them on this uh, IPy leaflet. This was a, I wouldn't say it was an afternoon hack. This was me bored sitting in a, a, a session at Google that I was listening to some other person's presentation and zoning off. So I figured out how to use Earth Engine on this iPy leaflet in the course of an, uh, about an hour of listening, or not listening to somebody. Um, so it can be very productive, and I encourage you to do that, just not here. Um, and then BQ Plot uh, is another one that I make a lot of use of for geospatial data. This is a widget that allows you to do these, these graphs of a sort, 2D graphs. They can have time animations. And the key part of all of, of these graphs that make them really useful is you can actually select data on the presentation as well. And I'll show you a little bit of that later. And then finally, it, these uh, widgets in isolation for me aren't the most useful, but when you can combine one widget to control another widget, you can get a lot of kind of higher order effects, which I'll be uh, demonstrating in here. Uh, this is actually sort of a pain point of working with these widgets right now, is trying to 
build these interactions, these events, uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for making that easier to do uh, within the Jupiter ecosystem. Okay, so back to my overview here. We've kind of gone through like why I think widgets are cool. I'm gonna talk now a little bit about the geospatial backend. And once again, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna present stuff from Earth Engine, but there are other groups that are doing this. Uh, Digital Globe has uh, their geospatial backend. Pangeo, who was, which was talked about in the keynote, is making a backend. Uh, there are many, many groups that are working on this. Uh, this is a graph of abstracts that are mentioning Jupiter at AGU, which is the largest Earth, Earth and Space Science uh, conference in the world. It's about 25,000 people get together. And so that orange line down there is from 2011 to 2017. I've been tracking, you know, who is talking at least about Jupiter in their abstracts. And it's going up. It's only one-tenth of one percent of the abstracts that are there at this point or, or of the total people that are there. So there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, the blue line in there is kind of uh, showing Earth engines uh, mentioned at the same conference. And I put that there is just because I think that we will slow down relative to Jupiter, and Jupiter will catch up really quickly because we deal with the Earth, and there's a lot of other people that deal with the space part of, uh, <laughs> of the American Geophysical Union that will have use of Jupiter as well. Uh, but I see them as being like uh, very complementary and starting to see a lot more interest in these, in these things. Okay, so a little bit about Earth Engine. It's uh, our cloud-based data uh, processing platform. We want to make it uh, useful for scientists, so we are presenting the raw data. We're not, we're basically cutting it up and storing it efficiently, but it's still the same bands, the same projections. It's the same metadata that you could get from the original data provider. Um, but then uh, put it on a parallel system so it can be blazingly fast to do um, computations on it. And then build tools on top of that that make it easy for folks that are working on these areas like deforestation that they can actually get off of the ground and running, not managing an entire like IT workforce to try to manage satellite data. That's our goal. Uh, what we do, how we implement that is we co-locate a lot of data, uh, geospatial data in our data centers, and then we put about a thousand algorithmic primitives that are specialized for that geospatial data next to it and make it available through an API, and then we can scale our system up and down depending on the amount of users. Um, so at its core, it is basically a web API that knows a lot about geospatial stuff, and it has a lot of, uh, in its back pocket, a lot of geospatial data sets to work with. Uh, just a little bit about our public data catalog. We are pretty much, uh, uh, we add stuff at the demand of our users. So we have this active like request list of like there's another geospatial data set that somebody wants on land cover or climate data or something like that. And we will uh, evaluate how difficult it will be to write an ingester and get it into our system. And we do that continuously. We have a team that works on that cons consistently. And we uh, set up feeds for the ones that are, are ongoing. Like a lot of the satellites, you'll get 1,000 or so images uh, every night coming into there. Uh, we have, this is an old slide, so it's over 10 petabytes. At that point, it doesn't really matter. It's just like a lot of data there. And it is, you know, on the order of 5,000 new images every day. It's not always, you know, the ones that were taken now. They might have been pulled off of disk from like 10 years ago. But it's continually um, being uh, updated. Which actually, as a side note, this makes it hard for that reproducibility argument when you're working with a system like this. Because the collection of data that is available for any uh, bounded space and time is changing all the time. And so it's really hard to nail something down when you're working at continental to global scales uh, with data sets like that if you want to recreate specifically. You can redo it, but you might not get exactly the same result. Uh, in terms of what we can do with that data, we have a wide variety, about a thousand right now, of these geospatial uh, primitives. So we have the concept of images, collections of images, features, collections of images, and we can operate them on, on them. If you want to know more about this, there's now a, a paper in Remote Sensing Environment about a year ago that goes through the details, the technical, like what do we decide to do when we set up the system. Uh, very interesting. But at a high level, this is the best I can describe it in like one graph is like we have a lot of source data sets. Those are gray boxes at the top. We allow people to create a directed analytical graph that describes how we want to process those data into an output. You can do that through a JavaScript or Python API and it's a lazy system, so it never gets evaluated until you actually need to, uh, and unless you request something like a particular tile or a table or something like that, so it can be very fast to experiment with. We have uh, two APIs, JavaScript Python API. We do most of our teaching with the JavaScript API right now because it's been easiest. When we set this up, 
uh, Jupyter didn't exist. Um, but now we have a lot of users that want to customize their environment for their own workflows, and so I see Jupyter as like the, the best solution for that using the Python API. And so as I said, very happy with this uh, uh, setup here. Uh, I really appreciate, and I'm sure pretty most of the people here at this conference appreciate the, the impact that Jupyter has had, and I'm really great to see that they have been awarded this. In the smaller community of, of Earth science, or at least remote sensing, uh, about the same time last year, uh, Earth Engine was awarded their Technical Achievement Award that they've only awarded twice before in their history, and one was for these large format aerial cameras, and the other was for GPS. So. Um, Kind of, we're really uh, happy about that award, and we've been having a pretty large impact in some parts of the remote sensing uh, area. So let's see what, how much time I got back. About, about 10 minutes, awesome. All right, so first demo I'm gonna do is a canned one, because I didn't know what time I'd have, but we have enough time to go live for the second one. So I'm gonna show you uh, linking up iPy Leaflet as a widget here. It's got a draw control tool. tool. You can drop it somewhere on a, a location, and that will give you a time series down in a BQ plot type of graph on the bottom. You can actually use the selectors of BQ plot to highlight time areas that you are interested in. Once you do that, you can request all of the data sets from Earth Engine and they're displayed on the map. So it's kind of a back and forth uh, two-way communication of those widgets. You're using the, the time series to input what is displayed on the map and the map to, do, to control what's displayed on the time series. And over on the right, there's a bunch of other widgets. There's an HTML widget for a legend. There's a bunch of drop-down widgets and date widgets there that allow you to fine-tune the, exactly the climate data that you are extracting out. In this case, uh, I guess it's only over there on the legend, that was looking at freezing days that are predicted to occur in under future climate projections. So this is a data set that you hear about when there is the, the CMIP archive is basically the, the underlying data set for this. Uh, but this is just a pretty simple viewer, um, at least simple for somebody to, to use. It's still a little bit hard to hook up the events to, to make that happen behind the scenes, but allows you to access this potentially you know, hundreds of terabyte uh, data set on the back end. Uh, the next one I want to show you is we're going to go try to go live here. Uh, I'm going to go into Jupiter Lab at this point to show you something with satellite data. And I'm going to, I guess we won't step through it all because that won't be the most interesting, but I'm going to run all the cells. Uh, key point here at the t top is I have the step of initialization to Earth Engine. Earth, in Earth Engine allows you to authenticate a server if you are, are given permission to access Earth Engine. We're up around 80 thousand people that have access now to Earth Engine right now, so it's not very exclusive. There's a very easy way to sign up for it. Uh, but you do have to initialize basically the Python kernel before it allow you to proceed by this step, or pass this step. All right, uh, down below, this is just extracting a little bit of information on uh, Landsat data. Once again, this is a similar graph saying like, which channels of the Landsat sensor are providing you information on different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm gonna be focusing on a, uh, a derived indice called NDVI, which if you have done any remote sensing, it should be familiar. They teach this always in the, in the introduction to remote sensing kind of classes. But it basically is a, a dimensionless ratio that's comparing the near infrared to the red parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And if you want to think about it, if you don't really want to understand what NDVI is, you can just think is how green it is, how, how much vegetation is there, is how you can interpret it that. Uh, in order to calculate NDVI on like the entire Landsat collection, which might be hundreds of thousands of images, what we can do is define like one function here that is add bad NDVI that works on an image. And then once we have this function that is created, uh, which is an along function, we can basically map that over the entire collection. So this is where the lazy evaluation becomes very, po uh, very powerful. We're not actually running it on all of these hundreds of thousands of images. We just have defined what will happen if you actually start to access any of the images in that collection. It will calculate NDVI for you. Uh, let's see, then we'll get down to the widgets. Uh, I found that when I'm working with these declarative widgets, you want to uh, usually create a debugging widget so you can print all your errors out as you're going along, um, but that's all covered in the widget documentations. I'm gonna instantiate a charting widget here, a mapping widget here with a marker so that I can move around, and then finally a button that allows me to center my marker if I lose track of it. And then finally there's a step of laying out your widgets on the screen. And so now I have basically this uh, viewer 
that I can then, we're gonna put that into a new view for the output. So it can make it a little bit larger. I'm gonna hide my table of contents and resize. And now let's go start exploring NDVI. Um, so first I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so we see where we're at. We are looking at California. I'm gonna go a little bit farther so we can see that. Uh, Central Valley of California, there's a lot of agricultural there, so you get really interesting NDVI patterns. The tiles that are being displayed here are from the OpenStreetMap project, but you can replace it like with whatever tiles you want. Um, and what I can do is grab and like say, hey, maybe I'm interested in this point. And this point, I'm, I'm using IPI leaflet to select with a point, but you, it also has tools for like building complex polygons and circles and things like that if you want to select geometries. And that works fine with uh, Earth Engine as well. Um, at that point, make that a little larger, uh, we have a time series that's going back, uh, you know, March, I don't know, 2013, about that time period to the, to the present. And as soon as you move it over to like another location, you can get it to update as well. In addition, if you see any interesting patterns in time, you can highlight them, and then it's gonna start generating tiles here. So let me move it over to a more dark green field because that's gonna be intense, you know, a high signal of NDVI at that point. Uh, and then maybe I wanna look farther out into the future when we had maybe a cutting of whatever the crop is, I don't really know, then the NDVI is low, et cetera. Um, the nice thing about this is once you have it working, I mean, it works at scale. We can start looking at the Western United States. This is how we store the data. We store it in different levels of aggregation, pyramiding it. And then you can go find, you know, other interesting features that are around. Uh, there's, you know, layer controls that are pretty standard for looking at geospatial data. And if you want, you can move to easily to other parts of the world. I always think that this uh, arid part of the Middle East is interesting to look at because they have some really interesting structures in terms of agriculture. I don't know what this one is called, but it is you know a field of these central pivot irrigations uh, in the middle of the desert, basically. And once again, you can get your widget back here and interrogate it. So this is a pretty simplistic kind of like just exploratory uh, analysis tool, but you could use it for a lot more complex things. I didn't incorporate yet, but I have plans to some of the more creative widgets that are part of BQplot that will allow you to do like cross-validation of models uh, in a geospatial context. I'm interested in exploring uh, the IPI volume that actually has the 3D kind of geometries because some of the characteristics that you're trying to extract when you have multiple dimensions of data, you might be able to drive some more insight using those uh, higher order widgets as well. I think it's pretty open-ended in terms of like what we could do uh, with that. So let me move forward back to my slides just for a little bit. Um, so once again, the reason that doing all of this is to get at these global issues. And, at the, and the United Nations has a set of sustainable development goals and a lot of what Earth Outreach and Earth Engine focuses on can map pretty strongly onto these. I tend to focus more on like the water and agriculture related ones. Uh, there's other kind of earth scientists within the team that focuses on other aspects like deforestation and land cover change of different kinds, uh, legal fishing, et cetera, like that. But a lot of these sustainable development goals that the UN's putting out, they have a geospatial component of it. They're trying to gather statistics and change over time for many different regions of the world. Some of it can be derived from remote sensing. I definitely would not say a, a majority of them, but remote sensing can have a, a good way to get a base level uh, estimate of what's going on in the world. Uh, so. I'd invite whoever is working on similar issues like that so we can figure out ways to collaborate about solving these issues. Uh, as I said, in particular, I am very focused on water use and in particular, how much water is coming off of the earth at scale. So this is important for you know, famine prediction, for agricultural monitoring, uh, et cetera. Um, this is, uh, anyway, that's what a lot of my time is spent on. Uh, so where to go next if you're interested in this? Um, there's a lot of documentation on the widgets, but it's rapidly evolving, I would say. Uh, and in Earth Engine, we put a lot of our resources online. Um, there is a GitHub community that does experiments of Earth Engine with Jupyter uh, within there. Uh, the second bullet in there is our recent user summit where there's videos and tutorials on like other uh, things that Earth Engine has been used for. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it for if there's any questions.
Thank you, Tyler. Um, I think I saw one question over here. So. Um, what's the current status of the S2 uh, spatial indexing project? That is not an Earth Engine thing in general. Um, we do use S2 for some of our indexing, so I can't really give you a, a very authoritative answer on the status of it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically an indexing that we use considerably within Google, not just on Earth Engine. Any other questions? All right, well, let's thank our speaker once again and go get some lunch. <laughs>